Hello, and welcome to this week's program of the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. My name is Frahin, and I thank you all for being here today. Each week, we connect with, with and hear from speakers who usually have a message focused on our love for innovation, entrepreneurship, and education. Today, we have an exciting presentation from Dean Axelrod. Dean is the immediate past president of the Rotary Club of Santa Barbara and serves on the club's board. He is the Associate Director for Partnerships and Philanthropy at Direct Relief. He'll be talking about how Direct Relief, the first charity accredited as a wholesale distributor of prescription medications and a trusted charitable partner in more than 100 countries, is using its global reach to help address healthcare inequities throughout the US and in low, low resource communities around the world. With that said, Dean, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, I really am uh, so pleased to be here to talk with you about Direct Relief's work to improve health equity in, in the United States and globally as a fellow Rotarian, it always means a lot to me to be able to uh, have these conversations uh, with other Rotarians. <clears throat> Direct Relief um, for 73 years has been working to improve the health and lives of people who are affected by poverty, natural disaster and other emergencies. People who are poor get sicker, they get sick more often and die younger than those with money and access to resources. And the impact is hardest on those who face uh, systemic structural discrimination, which can come in a variety of forms. And that's true globally, um, it's true in the United States. And COVID-19, as we've seen in the past year, has really highlighted the severe inequities that exist globally. Um, and we've really seen it starkly in the United States among persons of different races, as persons of color have experienced uh, really disproportionately higher rates of infection, hospitalization, and death from the virus. Direct Relief's purpose has always been to improve equitable access to health care by equipping doctors, nurses, and community health workers who serve the world's most vulnerable and at-risk populations. Um, whether they're refugees or internally displaced persons, or people living in poverty, um, or people who for other reasons simply don't have access. And I think as we have all seen um, in the past year, uh, the organization's work is needed now more, uh, more than it ever has been. Direct Relief was founded by a businessman. He was a successful industrialist from Estonia and uh, fled Europe during the Second World War, settled in Santa Barbara, it's a great story on its own, um, but he established direct relief after uh, the war with $2,000 of his own money and a couple of core business principles. Uh, the first of those business principles is the importance of partnership, also a really strong Rotarian value. Uh, local partners understand the region, the population, the demo uh, demographic differences. They know best what's needed. They have a stake in the community and a stake in the outcomes and they can guide the assistance in order to make it more precise and more efficient. Um, direct release programs are all about delivering specifically requested assist medical assistance. Uh, they're tailored to the particular circumstances and needs of a given community. And again, since its founding from day one, the tradition of direct targeted assistance provided in a manner that respects and involves the people served has been fundamental. And that's how we strengthen existing health systems. We're not looking to create things that are new or reinvent the wheel or tell other people how to do it. We're here as a support organization to help give a boost, a little lift to what's already there uh, by providing them with resources. They almost always have expertise wherever you look, wherever you go. There are organizations, there are people with expertise and skills helping those who need a little help, um, uh, but they just often lack uh, the resources uh, to do it. So that's principle number one. Um, the second is simply this, don't pay for things that the manufacturer will donate. And we'll talk a little bit about more, a uh, little bit uh, about that more in a moment. <clears throat> Rot Rotary clubs have always been uh, an important partner for direct relief, almost from the beginning. Why? <clears throat> because who better than a Rotary club uh, to give um, insight into a local community, to help facilitate uh, and mobilize resources, when direct relief can provide medicine and medical equipment to an under-resourced uh, small rural health facility in a country, let's say in um, Southeast Asia or in Sub-Saharan Africa, 
the facility may have the expertise to deliver care, but not necessarily the expertise or the resources to receive products, get it through customs, find transportation, and get it to the facility. Direct Relief delivers uh, aid at no charge, but once it's in the country, uh, the local facility needs to be able to get the products to where they're going. We'll help, but we can't do it all. <clears throat> and a Rotary Club is often there uh, to assist, to provide that local expertise. Um, some recent examples, um, two or three years ago, uh, there was a massive polio vaccination effort in a part of India where a Rotary Club and the local government uh, had organized it and uh, BD, the manufacturer of the syringes had lined up the donation, millions of syringes, um, but ran into a log logistical challenge. BD is a long-term partner of Direct Relief. They thought we'd be able to help them out. They brought Direct Relief really thin and we were able to make it happen. The beginning of last year with the wildfires in Australia, this picture is from the Rotary Club of Melbourne. The first person we called um, was at the Rotary Club of Melbourne to try to help us connect with first responders and other organizations that were responding to the wildfires. And again, had the expertise in the people but needed the resources. We keep a, an inventory of N95 masks in our own, um, in our wildfire preparedness inventory uh, because of the work we do in California. Uh, responding to wildfires. And we were able to make millions of masks available uh, to folks in Australia, thanks to the Rotary Club of Melbourne and other partners. <clears throat> partnering upstream is just as important as partnering with facilities downstream. Uh, companies that, uh, you know, these global companies that manufacture goods at scale have a philanthropic resource that is their scale. The incremental cost of production is minimal. The desire to do good and to help is there. Uh, executives don't check their compassion and empathy at the door, but they often don't have a way once they're at work to manifest, I guess, their, their desire to help. It's hard to make the, the business case. In fact, I don't know very many people who can make a really good business case for giving away, uh, you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of, of goods. Um, but the desire is there, and sometimes there is a business case for it, but what's needed is a reliable, transparent, accountable partner who can help um, get the products where they need to go. The other problem is that the companies that have the goods don't know where the need is. Right? They have wonderful technology and systems for identifying markets and customers who can pay for their products, uh, but they don't have a good way of identifying people who need them but can't pay. But Direct Relief knows where they are and we can um, be that missing link in the humanitarian supply chain. One of the ironies of life is that uh, many of us who have resources and may not have a really high need. Um, the companies who want to sell us stuff, you know, will chase us all over the internet. Uh, but if you don't have resources, you're not doing a Google search to look up a health condition. Um, and so the drug companies aren't looking for you and they're not, they don't know where to find you. Uh, so Direct Relief's role is to sort of aggregate that global demand and to provide a more efficient sort of funnel um, so that the companies that make the products that people need uh, can have a single point of contact, and then we can handle the logistics and the distribution the way a commercial wholesale distributor would, uh, making life easy at both ends. Uh, but again, that simply doesn't exist or didn't exist until Direct Relief created that reliable link in the chain. So we're best known for emergency preparedness and response. <clears throat> that's where the headlines are. That's the news coverage, fast, precise response to natural disaster and other emergencies. Um, we've become expert at logistics, the largest pre-positioning, uh, facility pre-positioning of emergency medical supplies globally. Um, we can identify partners. At this point, 73 years later, we have a huge global network, and we're still uh, bringing new partners into our network. Uh, we know how to identify the need, and the goal is to prepare and respond, to be ready so that on the worst day ever, you're not trying to figure it out for the first time. So long-term partnerships make that possible. Emergency preparedness and response is what we're best known for, um, but most of what we do is ongoing support day to day, 365 days a year, uh, working to increase health equity globally. <clears throat> and again, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, um, people who are poor will get sick more often, they'll get sicker, they'll die younger. 
and all of the work that Rotary Clubs and others, so many humanitarian organizations and government agencies, and United Nations programs are working to improve educational opportunities, improve uh, economic opportunities. But people who are sick and don't receive care can't work. They can't go to school. They get poor or they stay poor. We've seen that even in the, in the United States. Uh, uh, hospital bills are a leading cause of bankruptcy in this country. And so breaking this vicious cycle is a, is a complex endeavor. It requires changes in many areas other than health uh, services, but under whatever scenario you look at and however you're trying to help, I think we can agree that better access to health services is essential. And health services is only step one. If people need medication to treat or prevent um, an illness, seeing a doctor is one thing, but being able to get the medicines is something else. So that year round support, not only um, helps with the long-term strategy, but it also is what makes the emergency response possible. As I said, responding to an emergency is doing what we do every day, but just doing it faster and at larger scale. And so equity is addressed by directing resources to the places where the social determinants of health are low and the social vulnerability is high. And we can go into that a little bit more during the question and answer if um, uh, you're not sure exactly what, uh, what that involves. This is just a, a picture I wanted to share with you of what this can look like globally. This is at a refugee camp for Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh where Direct Relief supplied resources to build a brand new isolation center for uh, doctors and midwives to, prevent every, uh, to provide everything from uh, COVID-19 testing to labor and delivery services at a maternal hospital there. So improving health equity in the US looks very similar. It's a little different in some ways. Um, we have a long history in this country um, where, um, you know, the history of racism, slavery, um, and uh, government policies that have um, made it very difficult for communities of color to get access to quality health care. And uh, one of the large, a large focus area for direct relief, as well as the Biden administration, is community health centers around the country, which serve typically ethnic and racial minority communities that have been disproportionately affected uh, and punished by the pandemic. Um, we can go into more detail about the, de uh, the details of how that relationship works uh, during the Q&A, but that is uh, also why Direct Relief has established the Fund for Health Equity in the United States with an initial commitment of $75 million. Um, lead donors are AbbVie Foundation and Mackenzie Scott, and our goal is to raise $150 million um, to uh, support the activities of these community health centers around the country. Using technology has been key to Direct Relief's success and growth over the years. Um, it's um, never been a matter of, of, of need or ability to acquire resources to satisfy the need that's out there. It's always been a matter of technology that's enabled going to scale. That's true in the business world. It's been true for direct relief. And that's why we have pursued technology solutions to these challenges, to increase capacity, to do what we do better and more efficiently. These are some of the results we've achieved. Uh, I'd be happy to go into uh, those metrics a little more. And I'm going to wrap it up there. And we can go into more detail during the Q&A portion. Great. Dean, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, before we go into question and answers, I'm going to um, quickly introduce the other members on the call. So uh, when I say your name, please wave. We have Rory in Houston. We have uh, Nick in British Columbia, Canada. Manu in Hamburg, Germany. Cecilia in the Bay Area. Shags in the Bay Area. And our guest and hopefully future e-club Rotarian, Afra in San Ramon. So uh, who, does anyone have the first question? Um, if not, I will ask a lot. Well, I have one, um, and I'm curious, uh, just connecting Rotary and, and uh, Direct Relief, um, how, how does it, uh, I mean, I, I hear that obviously donations and, and that kind of thing, but how is it that we as clubs can, can best uh, work with Direct Relief? That is a, a, a question that probably today has more pertinence than, um, than ever, because yes, um, financial support has always been very valuable. Um, and Rotary Clubs have just been fantastic partners stepping up um, to raise money to support the work that we're doing. 
seeing how it goes hand in hand with what so many Rotary clubs are doing both in their own communities um, and in other countries. But more importantly, um, uh, one of Direct Relief's sort of core operating principles is um, that, you know, respecting um, you know, the dignity, not just of the people we're serving, but also of our donors and treating people the way they want to be treated. And one of the things that we've learned is that people don't like to be hounded um, to give. What people want is to know what you're doing, why it's important, and to have enough information to decide whether it, it is consistent with their values and the way they want to help. And what Rotary Clubs could do, uh, because Rotary has a, a platform and a megaphone, if the work that direct relief does speaks to you and your club, one of the most valuable things you could do to help is to help share what we're doing. Whether that's what you're doing here, this is gonna be a recorded presentation, it'll be available on your website. Um, but if as individuals or as a club, you're inclined to follow our social media and share stories that are compelling, uh, we publish a lot of news on our website. It's not you know, sort of self-congratulatory, um, give to direct relief because it's a great cause kind of work. It's really, uh, we're a news provider to Google News and Apple News, and, and we have a couple of journalists who are very, very good writers on staff. If you see stories that speak to you, share them. If you see something on Twitter or Facebook, share it, repost it. Um, and finally, what I'll say is that, um, you know, volunteers for direct relief have found novel ways to support the organization simply by doing the things that they love, whether it's uh, gamers who are streaming um to raise money and awareness um do it if it's you know if you want to use twitch to have a knitting competition because the members of your club like to knit do it um and if you need um somebody from direct relief to you know sign on and share a few words about what we're doing or just to engage let us know and we'll work with you so that gives you hopefully some ideas on the ways uh rotarians can help Great. Um, we have a question in the chat from Manu. So much appreciated. Very impressive. My question, as Dean has been talking about technology, what is Direct Relief's take on digital health? And um, is it part of digital relief's, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Direct Relief's work yet? Well, go ahead. I think calling us digital relief is a, is a, a great sort of forecast into the future. Uh, a couple of years ago, actually, our, our, our board chairman, um, a few years back, um, who's also a physician and um, had a close relationship with uh, the founder of a company called In Touch Health, uh, which is a developer of a robot, robotic uh, telehealth uh, platform and, and hardware, uh, which is located just up the street from Direct Relief's headquarters here, got together and thought, you know, um, we can, one of the things that, that uh, facilities need, in a, particularly in rural under-resourced communities is access to expertise. And telehealth is one way we can do it. So let's see if we can partner and identify the facilities that need that access, have the infrastructure, and could put uh, this kind of equipment to use. And they began to roll some of that out. Uh, Direct Relief has funded an initiative in Puerto Rico to increase access to expertise and support uh, medical specialists through telehealth, not by giving um, direct equipment, but by being able to fund their access to uh, companies that are able to provide the services and the hardware. So it's an important part of what we do. It's certainly the future of healthcare in so many ways. I don't know, uh, you know, a, a typical disclaimer, uh, I'm not a doctor and I don't play one on television. Um, but if you look around, you can see the pandemic has shown the importance of telehealth, um, even accessing communities that traditionally, you know, this, this gap, this, this technology divide that the pandemic, again, has really put a spotlight on. Um, even with that limitation, community health centers have found ways to use cell phones, smartphones, other kinds of resources to help people get access to healthcare. Because look, the communities we're serving, not only are they, broadly speaking, um, more likely to be sick, um, but they also, um, you know, we're talking about chronic conditions, which can be managed. Uh, we've got the medicine, we know how, they're really good at helping their patients understand lifestyle changes and managing these conditions to keep people out of the emergency room, right? That's the goal. Let's not overwhelm emergency rooms with 
conditions that can be managed and treated as long as you've got the resources. And so they were finding very effective ways to use simple things like phone calls, helping people get access to cell phones and other organizations doing that as well. In our community, the local cable company, um, helping you know, boost people's access to, uh, to broadband and devices. So I think it's important. I think it, it's currently an important part of direct relief's work. I think it'll continue to be. How it plays out uh, will depend a lot on what the health centers we support tell us their needs are. Great, thanks Dean. Next we have Cecilia. Um, hi Dean, sorry I came in a few minutes late, but um, I'm curious uh, <laughs> how familiar you are. Are you a Rotarian? I am. Okay, so the Rotary Foundation a couple of years ago established a an emergency relief type fund. It was, they've always been a, we're not a relief agency or whatever, but the demand from Rotarians have, you know, finally gotten them to rethink that a little bit. And so I'm wondering whether your organization has been benefited from it or been able to access it. I'm not even sure how as a Rotarian we would get access to that. And I'm sure right now that fund is depleted because of COVID, but um, if you could, address that it would be great and then i'll have one more question okay well whether you can ask the second question is up to Fahim. that's not really my choice so uh, <laughs> but i'm happy to answer as many questions as you're allowed to ask the um i don't think that direct relief has been a direct recipient of um uh, rotary relief funds per se i don't know whether there are clubs that may have been able to tap into that um through other granting uh, mechanisms um and using matching grants and so on I know that um, I was a, a speaker at the World uh, Rotary World Peace Conference last year and connected with some folks there from Rotary International to talk to them about how we could potentially work more closely. And, you know, Rotary is a, um, it's an organization with its own ways of doing things. And sometimes, as you've just pointed out, the wheels can turn slowly. They turn and they move forward, but they don't always move forward quickly. And I think in some ways that's, you know, that's part of Rotary's success is it steps very carefully and it has, you know, a stellar reputation and has earned tremendous trust around the world. Uh, but it can also be frustrating because sometimes you see a need and an opportunity and it's difficult to act on it quickly. Um, if anyone in the club or anyone who watches this video um, uh, knows a way to um, connect either to a working group or to um, a part of Rotary that is working with um, those, those funds or programs that are related to kind of a response effort and, and would like to connect, um, please uh, email me, daxelrod at directrelief.org, and I'd be delighted to have that conversation and see what we could do. Great. Well, I'm, so I would be the one, I will do the research and I'll be in touch with you because I've actually been the Rotary Foundation chair for our district. As well as the grants chair for ten years, and so I'm have lots and lots of high level contacts at the Rotary Foundation, and I can. It's just it was a relatively new program started just about the time I retired and went off to Ethiopia for the Peace Corps, which is my next question. <laughs> um, and so uh, I'm curious about you know now that you are here in front of us talking about what you do, I'm kind of curious to see what the Rotary Foundation really is doing about that and how one goes about accessing it, because I'm sure it's a Rotarian-led initiative in order to do that. Not yeah. connected, it's not connected in any way to their regular grants programs. I know that much. Okay. So my second question is, are you involved at all in the relief operations, well, such as they are, in the Tigray with specifically, you mentioned refugee camps and that's, there are 90,000 Ethiopians living in Sudan on the other side of a border and a river um, that are displaced as a result of a terrible conflict yeah. um, in Northern Ethiopia. And I'm just curious whether you've had any involvement with that. Yeah, I'm glad you, you brought that up. It's so, um, you know, <laughs> There's so much need in so many places. Um, yeah. and there are so many conflicts in so many places. Um, and it can be hard to it can be hard to keep up, frankly. Um, and this one was actually one that you know I don't think is getting a lot of press, even though the, you know the region gets some press. 
the short answer is yes. In fact, there's a relatively new organization um, and uh, we published an article on uh, Direct Relief's newsfeed, I think just within the past week or couple of weeks. Um, and if you'll email me, I can send you a link if you don't find it yourself. A, an organization um, specifically, I think was initially focused on Eritrean refugees. And uh, we were able to help them with some grant funding. This particular organization has a US um, office and we were able to connect through that, the, the US arm, I guess we would call it, um, to be able to provide them with grant funding. Um, there are places where it's very difficult to ship material aid for a lot of reasons. You know, the airport's closed, there's no port of entry, the, there are no roads, or there's simply not a facility that we can identify and connect with and vet to make sure that it's a, it's a place where a donation could actually be put to use and not be diverted. Um, uh, but if we can build a relationship um, with someone in the US, we can often um, help more by providing money that they can use to then purchase what they need um, closer to home. Another way we're able to help is with related organizations on the ground who have ways of getting aid in and we can ship to them in places where that are less fraught. Uh, helping in Syria was kind of like that. We could ship to facilities in Turkey uh, through the um, Syrian American Medical Association, for example, we could get medical aid to Turkey, it could be trucked into Syria um, and get to uh, people who are working out in the field to provide health care. And so um, depending on the level of, of sophistication of a refugee camp, um, we can either ship product directly um, or a little more indirectly through partnering organizations. Well, there were tens of thousands of Eritrean refugees living in northern Ethiopia. And then when the government went in there to clean out the dissidents, right. I mean, it's really a full scale civil war and it's a mess, um, but they're not allowing, there is like reporters don't have access. The UN has limited, very limited access. It's a big, yeah. big problem. And so um, I imagine that if you're doing anything, it's sort of, um, only being done indirectly because of the difficulty. And of course, they bombed the main airport up there. I mean, the hospitals are all torn apart. Yeah. It's one thing after another, but, um, but I will go on your website and look and, and we can converse some more. Wonderful. Great, so since we're just right about out of time, I wanted to say again, thank you very much. Rotarian members and guests, please make sure you fill out the attendance section and leave us a comment down below. And so uh, again, Dean, thank you very much. And I will turn it back to you for your final words. Wow. Um, I think my final words are simply thank you. Um, as Rotarians, you do so much um, in so many ways to help your community and the world. Uh, to make the world a, a better place in the ways that each of us can uh, is, is deeply meaningful. And your invitation to me to come and have this conversation with you um, is really humbling. And I hope that we can find ways to connect and, and work together in the future to, uh, to serve both of our purposes. Thank you very much. And we will see the rest of you next week. <laughs>